So hello and welcome everybody to this lunchtime event of the Law, Finance and Technology Group from the University of Hamburg. My name is Georg Ringer and it's a great pleasure to welcome so many of you here at this event. Uh, we're very fortunate to have with us here today Professor Philip Treleven from University College London. He's a, a leading expert in computational science and has a particular interest in um, uh, well, how should I say, it's financial services and creative industries is that a good way of, of characterizing it. Yeah. He's also uh, directing the Financial Computing Center and um, doing an amazing uh, job on all sorts of uh, implications of startups and financial services vis-a-vis -vis digitalization. Uh, and he has an interest in uh, the legal and regulatory issues of all of those things, which uh, is the bridge to the stuff that we are doing. So it's fantastic to have you with us here today, Philip. Thanks so much uh, for your time. And we look forward uh, to your talk. The, the format is that um, Philip will talk for about 20 minutes. And if you have any questions during that, it would be great if you could just type them into the chat. We have uh, ample time afterwards to discuss that. Uh, so do keep your questions for that time. That's everything for me. Um, the virtual floor is yours, Philip. Thank you. I'll, um... Can everyone see that? Uh, just confirm it. Yes, thank you. We can. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so anyway, um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to give this presentation. Um, in terms of, uh, of innovation, this is a really sort of golden time. So although the world's suffering from, uh, from COVID and, uh, you know, and also lots of organizations are having to respond to the digital revolution, uh, there's obviously huge amounts of opportunities for everybody. Uh, and the two things I'm going to cover today uh, are basically uh, auto tools to automate um, uh, legal services for lawyers. We, I do a lot in, in the financial regulatory area, but also the judiciary. The sort of thing you'll be able to do in the future is you'll actually be able to ask uh, an AI system, you know, for example, um, am I compliant in this particular jurisdiction? If you're looking for your own particular opportunity, maybe to start your own law firm or to specialize, I'd recommend algorithm law because soon there are going to be billions of algorithms interacting with each other and with humans. And what algorithms are turning into are real artificial persons. Uh, and therefore there's going to be a lot of I won't say chaos caused by algorithms, but let, let's say there will be firms, uh, you know, with specialist divisions just doing um, litigation around algorithms or advising on the on you know on algorithm jurisprudence. I'm trying to move on to the next slide but, oh, I'm on, so um, I'm on the next slide um, okay. one of the things that I think more of an amusing than anything is the Chinese characters for crisis now, this isn't quite totally accurate but danger I think that you know we can all share that opportunity uh, and also opportunity for you as an individual or, or the, the university uh, whether you're an academic or a student or practitioners to actually, you know, do some really interesting research and, and, and start companies. And um, what's driving this in particular is for the last probably year, year, two years, there's been what I call a data tsunami. Uh, and this is uh, new technologies coming along uh, that, that are actually changing areas. And uh, financial services have been in the forefront of this, but it's now uh, these data technologies or AI technologies are now coming into other areas, uh, such as uh, retail, if you see all the work going on with you know, Amazon and, and such like, uh, with uh, law, uh, legal services is a good, good example, but, but also um, 
you know, healthcare, uh, so particularly all of the service sectors. And then in Germany, you've got industry of 4.0, which is again, again being, uh, it's the data revolution of applied to manufacturing. Uh, so uh, what, would, what we're seeing is we're now seeing digital marketplaces for finance, uh, for legal services, so sort of Amazons of legal services. There's unbelievable amounts of data around to be uh, analyzed. And legal firms, um, uh, academics, etc., are going to have to um, automate to be effective. Uh, so my view is, you know, big companies will probably continue to do well. Niche companies, perhaps doing in new areas like uh, algorithm law will do well. Um, the local law firm that you know does uh, you know wills and contracts and that for, for you know for, for local people probably do well. But a lot of middle ranking firms will either change and prosper or go out of business. And probably the biggest impact will be sort of a, a legal serve a legal equivalent of Amazon. Uh, and you can expect, you know, clients expect this, and you've also got globalization. So opportunities. You as, as an individual could set up a digital services um, marketplace uh, you, for regulation, uh, automation of, of, of laws and statutes. Um, it's now getting increasingly easier to actually do law tech startups. Uh, and uh, the one of the things I'm going to uh, talk about, which I think is going to be quite important, is actually computer executable legal contracts. So a little bit about my history. <coughs> uh, 25 years ago, we pioneered um, uh, automated fraud detection in finance and built the first uh, insider dealing detection system for London Stock Exchange. Excuse me. Uh, about um, 16, 17 years ago, we built the first algorithmic trading platform in Europe with Deutsche Bank for fixed income. We, we do a huge amount in regulation and, and naturally a lot of the work that we do in regulation applies to legal services. So um, we, this is a really a growing area for us. Um, it might amuse you that I also ran uh, the National Sizing Survey and we measured uh, 11,000 UK adults uh, for the 14 largest clothing companies using 3D body scanners. And uh, hopefully my wife isn't listening, but I can masquerade now as a fashion expert. So if anybody has any fashion advice questions, we'll take them at the end. Um, the great benefit that we've got, um, you know, I'm in a computer science department. Uh, we've got uh, 300 PhD students, very, if we can build software and do analytics. Um, most of them um, are traditionally have worked with outside organizations. Uh, we've got 650 master's students. Uh, and uh, these definitely do their projects with, you know, with banks, uh, the Bank of England, the regulators, uh, uh, retailers, law firms, etc. And we've got 500 undergraduates. And one of the things I'd like to share with you is that we've got this structure, which normally associated with Silicon Valley, uh, sort of sweeping through the departments. And an increasing number of, of PhD students uh, will, will now get involved with commercialization of their research in parallel to, the, uh, to their academic research. And what we've got is basically a digital incubator. So uh, students will have ideas, um, not just PhDs, but master's students, let's say for a, uh, you know, something to do around um, you know, algorithm auditing or, or something like something like that. Uh, and um, they'll do a student project, which is essentially research with a commercial potential. And if this sort of picks up speed and they've got some good, um, you might call IP, uh, then we get set up a student research team. We reach out to commercial partners uh, and uh, then it just naturally just flows through and the successful ones actually take it into a startup, are often funded by the commercial partners. And 
we've, we've had a lot of success. I, I've launched over 12 companies. Uh, we, uh, I've got uh, at least two students that have ex-students now that have, that have got unicorns, companies in excess of 1 billion. Uh, and I've got something over 12 or more stu uh, particularly ex-PhD students uh, that have um, sold uh, already sold a company for in excess of about 12 to 15 million euros. Uh, and recently two of my PhD students sold I sold their startup to Salesforce for $26 million. As you can imagine, this is a big impact on, on the sort of culture and the department. Data science. Um, what you've got, what I'm calling the data tsunami, is a bunch of data science technologies that individually are interesting, but they're actually coming together to actually change things. So you've got huge amounts of data, big data. You've got data standards, so you can actually combine the data, so you can analyze it. We're now developing uh, personalized avatars. So this isn't just something like Siri that are, tries to answer your question. This is something that's actually your personal servant uh, uh, that we program to work just for you. Then you've got really interesting artificial intelligence technologies, which we'll talk a little bit about, more about. And an, an area that I would like to bring to your attention because it's very important for uh, data privacy is federated learning. And um, I've got a paper if anybody's interested, I can forward it. And then there are other technologies like Internet of Things, uh, executable legal rules, digital object identifiers. It's actually what we call the perfect storm of technologies coming together that you can now do things that you could never do uh, before. So um, one of the things I was asked to do by the Bank of England was to give a talk probably about two years ago to the head regulators of all the European central banks. And, and one of the things they asked me to do, which probably was the most useful thing, was to actually give a simple introduction to artificial intelligence. And the starting point is algorithms. So there are basically three classes of algorithms, computational statistics, which are computationally intensive methods, complex systems like agent-based systems, uh, and then artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence, in fact, has three broad classes of algorithms, knowledge-based systems, evolutionary algorithms, and the one that gets all the publicity, which is machine learning, uh, which is obviously the most interesting because you've got these algorithms that evolve by programming themselves. So uh, the first rule-based systems, these have been around for a long time, pioneered for things like call centers, for supporting staff. And you, what you do is you take the knowledge of an expert and you code it up in if-then rules. And, and it is these if-then rules which just drive the questions in call centers. So if you're, somebody rings up for a loan or a mortgage, they're taken through a series of these questions. So good solid technology. And one of the great things about these knowledge-based or rule-based systems is that they can give an explanation of why they came to a particular decision which is especially important, obviously, for legal reasons uh, with lots of financial services. And move on a bit. Uh, the next um, the simple illustration of machine learning, um, a sort of classic, uh, can I train a neural network uh, to predict uh, tomorrow's um, uh, closing price? So you take a bunch of data, uh, like the S&P 500, uh, you then get your neural network. And the neural network, for those of you not familiar, uh, you should think of these little blue bobs, uh, blobs as a little bit like transistors. And as you put, in, put data into them, uh, they uh, accumulate the data. And then if they fire, they output a signal. And the way that the neural network learns is the, it's actually the connections on the connections, there's what's called a weight. And what, what you can imagine is like a little tap and you adjust it as the neural network learns or not. So you take a, a set of training data and you have a window and then you say, 
if you see this uh, pattern as I'm showing here, then the correct answer is this. And you just move this like a window across your training set, and hopefully the neural network will learn, doesn't always. Uh, and then finally, uh, when you've actually trained the neural network, you can then use it and um, uh, to put in a set of inputs, like previous days, um, um, closing prices, and it tries to predict uh, tomorrow's uh, price. Very simple to understand. Um, the other thing that's really <clears throat> very important, particularly for law tech, for legal tech, uh, is natural language processing and sentiment analysis. Reading text and trying to work out um, <clears throat> whether it's positive, negative, neutral, uh, or just trying to understand it. And there are lots of uh, interesting technologies around, and you can use these things for sort of behavior analytics, trying to understand uh, the actions of a group of people. So for example, you might um, build a system to look at the decisions of a particular judge or set of uh, judges uh, so that you can actually uh, organize your case in a particular way. Uh, and equally, there are things like predictive analytics and this is used a great deal in crime prevention to identify things like crime hotspots. Moving on, uh, there are even things like computational psychometrics, which is especially interesting. And, and these are techniques that are actually used in uh, things like um, recruitment algorithms. And there's a company that we collaborate with called HireVue, H-I-R-E-V-U-E, and, and they do it to identify candidates that would be good for a particular job or even teams of people. Um, now some legal applications. Two of them that I'm just gonna briefly talk about. Firstly, data privacy, hugely interesting and growing importance. And the second one, which is sort of work in progress, which is computer executable legal rules. And these can be contracts, regulations, laws, and statutes. And if you can actually make something that's computer understandable, computer executable, you can then automate it. So you can do things like automate trade contracts, or you can automate regulations so that you can see, ask questions of whether you're compliant in a particular um, jurisdiction, et cetera. So the first, and I recommend to, to you to take an interest in this, um, is federated learning. And this was developed by Google, and it's a pri privacy preserving both data infrastructure uh, and also a way to actually train machine learning algorithms on distributed data sets. And normally what you do when you're doing um, AI, you pull all the data into the cloud and then an algorithm analyzes it and, and gives out the results. The problem with this is everybody understands how important it is to both preserve your data and companies are um, getting increasingly interested in monetizing it and therefore they don't want to hand over their raw data, which might be credit card transactions or uh, you know, um, in information on um, loyalty cards, those, those sorts of things. And what you do with federated learning is that you actually take the algorithms to the data, to the uh, raw data. They all do in parallel their calculations. They then pass back the analyzed results of what they've learned. And then a master algorithm um, uh, puts that all together and distributes the result. And um, Google developed this uh, privacy preserving technology uh, for um, doing keystroke, excuse me, doing keystroke predictions uh, on their mobile phones. And clearly mobile phone users don't want um, Google to know every um, you know, thing that they might have typed in or possibly even spoken. And the three really important applications uh, for this, the first is um, uh, on device, uh, such as I was saying, like mobile phones, 
And this is very important for um, Internet of Things and, and such like. So you've got lots of very primitive devices. Uh, next, which I think will become increasingly important, where you've got a number of a small number of huge companies, for example, or organizations collaborating. So, if you, for example, if you were um, like a regulator would be an example, if you're trying to decide um, whether you know doing AML or a KYC. Uh, obviously, the regulators don't want to give up their raw data, but this would be allow, allow them to actually work together uh, to, uh, you know, identify uh, uh, breaches. And then finally, which often isn't talked about, is data as a service. Companies are now waking up to the fact that, that increasingly they can actually sell their very valuable data for, you know, a lot of money. And... The, the, a good example of this is MasterCard and some of the other um, uh, uh, some of the other credit card companies are now selling anonymous pipe of uh, uh, pipes of anonymous credit card transactions and investing investment companies are buying these so that they can actually analyze um, what's going through people's tills. They can't see necessarily who well they obviously won't see who's doing it. But they should be able to see what's being bought, how much is being spent, when it's being spent. It was quite interesting when I um, alerted the European regulators to this, they all looked pretty shocked, as you can imagine. Um, this is work in progress, and I think will have a huge impact. It's uh, computable or computer readable uh, rules. Uh, legal rules, which does, you know, contracts, regulations and laws. And, and the system that we're developing is that a professional, uh, a lawyer, regulator or someone drafting national laws will actually draft a text document in Microsoft Word. And then we have use AI to actually translate it and produce what we call a digital twin. Uh, and and, and th therefore you know that the computer executable part is identical to what you've got in um, your uh, readable part. The other way that people are approaching this is to try and have some extremely clever AI system that analyzes uh, uh, existing contracts, regulations, and laws. Uh, I'm fairly skeptical about this because of the ambiguity and complexity. So. Um, now, if you're looking for an opportunity for your career, uh, for specializing or, um, you know, starting a new law firm, etc., et or new um, academic research, I can certainly recommend um, machine learning algorithms. Uh, because these algorithms, because they're self-programming, you don't really know what they're doing. And therefore, interestingly, for the sort of future of uh, artificial persons is you've got rogue algorithms that act um, ethically, not intentionally, uh, that are dangerous. You've got algorithms that get into fraudulent activities like fraudulent trading. Uh, there's interest in auditing algorithms to make sure that they do what they you think. Uh, and there's even things like the potential to produce a sort of algorithm oracle. So you can ask, am I compliant? for trading, for example, uh, you know, in the, uh, not, I shouldn't use something in the European Union, let, let, let's say Canada, for example. Uh, and therefore, I think there's a big opportunity for things like, um, uh, you know, uh, algorithm jurisprudence and, you know, algorithms as artificial persons. Um, the nice thing is there's, uh, there's some really fantastic case studies around algorithms causing companies to go bankrupt, uh, algorithms destroying reputation like Google, Google's facial recognition uh, uh, application, uh, Boeing's uh, and also Airbus as well, uh, that have got algorithms that end up fighting with the pilots and crashing the plane, uh, Uber self-drive cars, you know, if, if, if one of their self-drive cars kills a pedestrian, you know, what do you do, uh, et cetera. And then, uh, you know, bias against women in AI. 
So um, lots of opportunities, algorithm interpretability, legality, ethics, fraud, uh, legal status, and that you have to say in the future, what I jokingly call crime tech, that there are going to be people putting out uh, illegal, you know, criminal algorithms or antisocial to do criminal and antisocial uh, acts. Um, so lots of interesting things. You've got, you know, they're intelligent, they're collaborative, they're, uh, they, uh, you, you need them to get understanding of conduct, enforcement, but potential algorithms can automate things. They can improve things like access to justice if we can make it work. And then finally, I think this is my final slide, uh, for you as an individual, uh, this is a wonderful uh, evolving opportunity. So you might get involved in automating legal tools or regulatory tools. We, we do a lot in that area. Uh, there's obviously a huge opportunity in, in developed countries for specialized legal practices that just deal with algorithms. Um, we do a lot in compliance and regulation, particularly in financial services to aut automate it. And if you're in academia, uh, there's the obvious, um, do we need a new set of laws specifically for algorithms, you know, or, or do and, and what I'd call algorithm jurisprudence. So uh, I'll stop sharing now. So um, I hope that was understandable and not garbled. Uh, and um, hopefully, uh, thank not you. Many people, not, not too many people have left. Out of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Philip. I think more and more people have joined as you've been talking because it's been so fascinating to listen to you and the many, many things that you're doing and uh, we're covering in your, in your talk. I'm sure there are lots of questions on these different aspects, but. Um, let me start with, you know, one question. So everybody, by the way, is encouraged to, you know, maybe the easiest is now to use the raise hand function in, in Zoom. If you've got a question, then maybe uh, use that. If you're not, you can also use the chat. But let me let me start the Q&A by asking you, Philip, so because you've been talking about um, uh, the sort of topic of law as a code, so how you can code legal rules and make them executable. So traditional lawyers have the perception that law is such a complicated affair uh, of so and so many ifs and buts and nuances and you know, uh, applying a, a legal rule to a set of facts is such a complicated issue that law students learn in the first year in law school that um, this is something that really is science fiction. So. Um, I'm wondering if you can specify a little clearer in what particular situations you think there is a case already for law as a code. I, I assume in sort of simplistic yes or no situations, but I assume that in, in sort of more complex applications of, you know, is that a torrent now uh, or not, uh, it, it might be much more complicated. So maybe you can say a few words about that. Yes, I, I, I tell you a story I, I, I had about... Um... 18 months, maybe two years ago, I had to give a lecture to uh, a lot of law professors on uh, uh, law tech. And they were all looking very sad. I was trying to persuade them that this was a, um, uh, an opportunity. And um, I, I said, um, one of the great things is that uh, if, if you're using um, algorithms, you can remove ambiguity you see, uh, and they all shouted out almost as if they were, but that's where we make our money, they said. Uh, so I said, okay, right. um, we'll put an ambiguity dial into our <laughs> systems <laughs> uh, so you can actually set the ambiguity level you'd like. But the serious uh, answer is that um, what executable legal rules will do. And, and, and why I think it's important that you, you probably can't work with existing codes. You probably need to start with a clean, as we say, a clean sheet of paper. You know, that's why we're saying, the, you know, the lawyer, the regulator, your, excuse me, the law commissioner writing law, excuse me, needs to specify it, and then we need to generate it. Um, 
excuse me, why it's very important is that you can start to automate things. And for example, um, uh, if you if you think of some relatively straightforward, well-defined things, if you're trying to start some work in this area, for sort of customs regulations would be an example, uh, where um, you know it's, it's they're quite tedious, but you want to start at the level of a single thing, like importing wine from a particular country or something, uh, so that you know you've got a chance of being able to specify it. Um, then uh, moving along, uh, for a lot of people, particularly um, uh, you know just normal people, um, you'll be able to give them advice on relatively straightforward legal matters. Uh, okay, and it could be even things like planning permissions and things like this, which should be, uh, uh, and and therefore you can improve access to law, access to to justice, and then. If you go uh, right through, um, I think the biggest driver will be commercial contracts. If you're shipping goods, say from you know, from you know, uh, say Shanghai to, to Hamburg or something like this, uh, then uh, you could have a, there. There are going to be probably about ten different groups involved in moving those goods, you know, by sea, all with a separate contract with um, uh, if you've got something that's ex executable, you could have a master contract that actually could run the whole show and make sure that people are paid when they complete uh, certain things. Um, equally, um, the lots of particularly big international companies pay a large amount of money to, to, to know if they're, they're compliant in a particular jurisdiction. And also, they are not informed if the law changes. Um, if you can have executable legal rules, and not only can they interrogate it, uh, but uh, you, you can also, um, they can also get notified that they're no longer compliant. So that was a long answer to your question. But, but, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think Great example of the ship from Shanghai to Hamburg, I guess the only the only problem is when you're stuck in the Suez Canal, right? Then. Well, yeah, absolutely. You, you know, but you can then ask the oracle. You know, um, <laughs> am I going to get fined? Who <laughs> could? Uh, is my is my insurance contract? Valid? Yeah, yeah, perfect, <laughs> perfect. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Look, we've got questions in the in the chat. So first was uh, Felipe Molina. Felipe, would you like to ask the question yourself, or should I read it out? I can ask him yeah. by myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering because um, you you said that if you are interested in this topic, you should uh, concentrate in, on machine learning algorithms. And I was wondering what skills should I learn to get a deeper knowledge in, in this field? Because um, all many people recommend to just read a book or... Uh, Yes, uh, look in look in online course, and I I think you need a, to gain a deeper knowledge. You need to I don't know code yourself or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, the, uh, the there's some brilliant online courses now, uh, and and what 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 you should just follow them so you've got an appreciation. You don't you know it isn't important that you can program a machine learning algorithm, but it's important that you um, appreciate what it can do for you and what it can't do for you. Uh, one of the things I've learned over the years, starting with building the um, inside the dealing detection system, you should never try and fully automate things. So we've, we, 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 luckily we didn't do it for the inside the dealing, but we tried to do it with um, automated trading systems. And, and after about three or four months, all hell broke loose. And then we went back to getting the human in the loop. So, you know, um, but I'll get, I can give you a particular example. Um, we've got, a, we've got a, a, a regulation startup that produces automated regulatory companies and the lady that runs it uh, was the, um, was the a, a partner, a regulatory partner in a major law firm. And, and when we set the company up, she said, oh, you must hire me a CTO. Uh, you know, a, a, a chief a technical officer to design the machine learning algorithms. And I said, no, we're not going to do this. Uh, we're going to teach you 
all you need to know about AI and and all these other technologies. Uh, and and very quickly, uh, she picked it all up, and she can now hold her, her own with even people that can program and and have a deep knowledge of, of AI. Uh, and and she is the one with the domain knowledge because of her work that was able to design all the software. So, you know, good call by me, as we say. <laughs> Great. We have another question from Gizem Alpa. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, first, I should say that thank you for your wonderful speech. It was very enlightening for me. And I have a small question regarding um, the European Commission yesterday uh, published their proposal for the regulation on uh, a European approach for artificial intelligence. Yes. And I wanted to ask whether you had um, read the proposal and whether you think it is uh, fit for purpose or not. Uh, yes, it's a very timely uh, question. Um, I, I've done a lot of work with the um, with our financial um, financial services people, your regulator, the FCA, and also with the Bank of England. And uh, the, the, the general answer to your question is that uh, you, you need to balance regulation and innovation. And therefore, yes, I did read it. I, I skimmed it, I must say I didn't read it in detail. Um, what, I would, what I would recommend is not to try and make a guess on what regulation you need for algorithms, but to, to actually um, try and give guidance to people who are developing algorithms okay to encourage best practice and then when you understand what regulation is needed then bring it in so uh, we we I, I i'm the chair of a national committee to look at algorithm certification to see if we should set up a national service and everybody thought it was a good idea we haven't done it but what we did do is i've got uh, two researchers who are now have now set up a start doing a doing a startup in algorithm audit and they're working with some major companies to actually do internal algorithm audit to try and understand the process and at some stage it might be the case that we say to the government actually we now know what we're doing you need some legislation okay but um i think it's dangerous to try and put legislation in place particularly with, now you've got global competition you know with america and china and, and places like this so we have to think about you know the future and um, you know the, the 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 you know the innovation part all right so we have more questions um christopher roof first oh yeah um thanks yeah, I also wanted to ask about the EU proposal, um, but I, that's okay. And I also have another one. Um, so um, one thing I, I often read in the context of this topic is, um, is automation bias. So this bias that you assume a decision is right when it's made by a, um, or comes out of a fancy algorithm, like simplified. Yeah. And, uh, to what extent do you see that becoming an increasing risk when, when using these tools, be it for lawyers or financial regulators? So in a sense of over-reliance on software, maybe. Uh, this, this, especially... is, this is why algorithm interpretability and algorithm audit is, is very important. Um, and uh, particularly in financial services um, and uh, you know, things like reputational damage, but not just financial damage. Uh, so from a, from a legal point of view, it's, a, it's an ideal opportunity for you, not <laughs> a risk. Uh, but uh, the, um, uh, the algorithm interpretability is very important. And interestingly, uh, many of the computational statistics techniques uh, and, and also you've got knowledge-based systems are very um, easy to get them to explain what they do or you can understand it. Uh, and the problem is because machine learning ev are, are self-evolving, you don't know where they're going to end up. So, for example, um, there, there was a problem with LIBOR, you know, that a number of people were manipulating the, uh, uh, the trading. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's algorithms, trading algorithms could unintentionally do the same thing. Okay. 
And the only way you're going to catch it is to do almost like the equivalent of fraud detection. So that was a long answer to the, the short one is that things like ethics, reputational damage, and all of these other things are going to uh, become increasingly important. And, and that's why algorithms as artificial persons aren't just like companies, which you know the company operates, but these algorithms evolve on their own uh, and, and therefore you don't know what they're doing. So it's going to be increasingly important that they're able to explain their decision-making. And, and lots of them can't do it. Lots of types of algorithms can't do it. But um, yeah, it's a very important area. Right. Now we have Pedro and then we have Merck. Uh, thank you again, Professor Philip, for the talk. It was great. I was curious about, um, uh, you, you had a slide that you talked a little bit about sentiment analysis. And I remember reading um, um, NBER uh, paper a couple of months ago where they talk about how the language uh, in corporate reporting have been changed in the last two decades. So they analyzed this data from the uh, SEC in the US uh, in how downloads of the material that are there, like change it from like around 30% to 80% are now downloaded by machines. So yeah. they analyze how that impacted the, how, how companies make that disclosure and reporting. And I was thinking about um, if the same phenomenon is happening with the legal field, like more and more of our material that we are writing are gonna be read by machines, like what will be impacted, like, have like um, the importance of legal writing focus on a new public of readers, like now that's machine. Yeah, th th well. this is yeah. this is uh, this is a really interesting uh, question. Is that you know technology are driving humans? That's why when we talk about our drafting tool, uh, I, d I don't think it, I, d I think it's going to be a huge challenge to try and go back and analyze existing documents. But what we should do is start. And this, I think, goes in what you're suggesting, which I think is very good, which is you should encourage people to actually draft um, regulations, contracts, laws uh, that, that, that are clear uh, and uh, they won't, you know, won't cause uh, problems. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like when you're generating data, you know, that you, that you collect, you put it in a common data format uh, so that um, systems can now, uh, can now analyze it. And we, we, we've got, we built a tool that reads uh, compliance PDFs that go to the regulators. I say to the regulator, and what it does is it tries to identify uh, which compliance reports are dangerous. So it's, got, it's, a, it's a very simple traffic light system, you know, red, amber, green. And, and I say, oh, it doesn't work very well. And they said, it doesn't matter, you know, uh, even if it works, you know, sort of occasionally, it's still quite a useful tool <laughs> for them saying, this looks dangerous. And they can just look and say, yes, you're right, or no, it isn't. So, but yeah, I think what you said about, um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting area, both academically, but also commercially. You know, you can imagine uh, getting a company or producing a tool that would analyze legal documents to give advice on, actually, this is going to be very ambiguous for uh, a machine learning algorithm. Cool, thank you. Merrick, did you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, I actually also wanted to ask something about automation bias, but uh, I have a different question as well. Um, in terms of the feasibility of the implementation of these computer readable uh, contracts, laws, um, I was wondering if you think that there might be adverse effects to a staggered in implementation, because I, I reckon that not, it would be impossible to immediately adapt every law and every contract that there is. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah. by definition, yeah. Yeah, I, this is a, a very interesting question. One of the things I'm very interested in is innovation. How do you support innovation? And, and, and the great thing is to do experimentation. So uh, we don't try and design the ultimate tool. Uh, we do a lot of very simple, you know, little things in little niche areas and they evolve and merge together. So yes, uh, so a good example is, you know, we're trying to get a automated system to help 
you know, generate what we call digital twin, something that's human readable or human writable readable and computer executable. <laughs> and, and what we're doing is we're looking for really trivial, you know, what you might call really trivial examples, one of which might be um, uh, importing wine, say, you know, to the UK from Australia, you know, that sort of really focused area. So if you can do that, then try and do it you know, for all wines, and then, you know, you, 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 you learn something. But it, 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 it's pretty difficult to actually do a sort of ultimate system, and there's plenty of examples of when it's been an absolute catastrophe. And that's why I think, you know, with the European Commission should do some experimentation, you know, and possibly not in such you know, you know, maybe in healthcare or something like that, where they can start to understand what legislation is needed. Great. Then I have Lucas Wagner on the list. Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, many thanks for, for the presentation also. It was very interesting. Um, you, you previously mentioned that it might not be such a good idea to regulate algorithms just now, but uh, maybe it, it makes sense to, to focus more on the data at this stage. So uh, require public and private entities to produce more structured data or well then in the legal field also to to uh, produce uh, usable data at all, because in, in Germany, for instance, it's still very rare that that court decisions, in particular from the lower courts, are, are published at all. So uh, whether that may, maybe might be an approach to focus more for the time being now. Yes, the um, there the are two things that, that, that are that are emerging. Um, the, the what you're talking about is data standards. Uh, and and th there's a number of countries now, like Singapore, looking at setting up, you know, legal services marketplaces. Okay, and these will only work if you've got a common uh, data format, you know, that, that all the um, the algorithms work to. Uh, equally, there's the that the, the, uh, the, our regulators are, are uh, pressing to to try and develop technologies for uh, coding the regulatory handbooks. Again, we need common uh, you know, data structures for that. So um, again, there's some good, good examples. You, know, you try and do it you know, for as simple a, an, an idea as, as possible, um, but there's an opportunity of whether you, know, you, you, you build it you know, uh, you know, as, as a startup or you Try and persuade the government, you know, the government legal services. But um, even the UK chief scientists say to me, if you want to innovate, get on with it and let government catch up. But, you know, don't try and <laughs> persuade the government to do it. So, uh, you know, it's, it's you know, it's something that you know you can you can now do, you know, as a research project you know, in the university or as a startup. Cool. So I have one question in the chat which I've been asked to read out. It's from Wigrid Stiel. And he asks, what do you think is the impact of AI on you know, the future law school education, on the syllabus at law school, yeah. future teaching yeah. of, of law, basically, at universities? The, I, 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 I'll tell you another story. The, the dean of our law school, who I know very well is a friend, uh, greeted me by saying, I hate you. I so said, why did you say that? She said, everywhere I go, everybody said, are you, working, are you involved in this marvelous automation, legal automation project? And she said, I know nothing about it, but I know who's behind this. Uh, so uh, I think the, uh, if, you, if you want to uh, help your students, you should be um, you know, teaching them, you know, even elementary programming, uh, building very simple tools, having some understanding of artificial intelligence and sort of basic skills. And, and if you do that, uh, it, it, it's in, in all of the service sectors, it, the, the most valuable people are professionals who can program, as it were, or you know, not to a great level, but understand technology. As I gave you the example of the lady who runs a regulatory company, uh, she has a, a very good understanding of technology now and she's immensely useful uh, because if you've got um 
some legal professional that doesn't understand what technologies can do. They often think it's magic, which definitely isn't. And, and, and if you go to the other extreme where you've got techies that, uh, and I've got lots of students who are trying to do law tech and really haven't got a clue uh, and you know, best advised to go and do a law degree, you know, so that they get a, uh, so um, the, the, this, this multi-skilled person is the most valuable person for the, for the future. Good, thank you. And then I have Philip, Philip Knocke. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Would you like to, to read your question yourself? Or? Yes, absolutely. Um, first of all, thanks so much for your talk. That was very interesting. And um, I have a question regarding regulation. You said you, you were not so much in favor for more regulation at this stage. But um, my question is, to your knowledge, are there any specific rules in place in any country you know of regarding the responsibilities for damages caused by algorithms? Maybe algorithms no. gone rogue or no, no, maybe no. algorithms that are programmed directly yeah, or yeah, just yeah. because... I, I, th I think potentially for, 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 for legal professionals, it's a huge area uh, for, for specializing in. And, you know, I've said this obviously to our, to our law firms. Um, at the moment, you're applying, um, you know, traditional laws. You know, it's like, it's like in years ago when we were developing algorithmic trading systems, they, they thought they needed to develop um, special laws for algorithms that were doing market manipulation. And I said, you know, you don't need that. You know, there's plenty of laws in place for market manipulation, whether it's by algorithms or, or, or individuals. Um, having said that, because these algorithms are increasingly becoming artificial persons with all the sort of problems that humans have, um, in a university law department, uh, what I've called algorithm jurisprudence, do we need a, a new set of algorithm laws would be an interesting study. But at the moment, the answer to your question is people are just applying existing legislation you know, in the country to it. Okay, but that means um, I am in a way um, responsible for auditing my used algorithms, right? Yes, yes. And that's why we've got this group that, that are um, looking at internal algorithm audit because most companies um, are extremely worried about being fined by the regulators or for reputational damage or for being driven out of business. And a, a good example of this is the uh, all this fly-by-wire software on um, the latest generation of airplanes, particularly commercial airplanes. And uh, there's been a, a, quite a number of crashes where the software often with a combination of human error, has basically taken over the plane and, you know, flown it into the ground uh, and, and that. And uh, th this is why, you know, Boeing had all this problem with the MAX system, but Airbus has had a, a number of crashes where, you know, this has happened as well. You know, often, yes, it was contributed by the pilot, you know, setting the dials wrong, and, but the, the program, you know, the computer then, the algorithm, and just flew the plane into the ground, which... And, and the pilot couldn't actually take control of the plane, uh, you know. And this is a good example where I'm a great advocate of just thinking of these as tools. And ultimately, you, you need to allow the humans to uh, get involved, um, you know, even whether it's a trading system or, you know, an automatic pilot. I can just add to this, Philip, this Thank you. Is, is really excellent because it's causing lots of headaches to lawyers all around the world, as you can imagine. And yeah. Um, um, as as both Phillips have been saying, you know, it's 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 causing problems to apply simply the traditional toolkit that we have of tort liability, which yeah. you know usually acquires some sort of scientist or some sort of awareness or negligence or something on the behalf of humans, right? And then uh, we run into deep problems when we have, for example, you know, as you were explaining in your talk, Philip, um, the, the sort of black box problem where we do not fully understand anymore what the 
algorithm is doing anymore. Right? So, yeah, and I think people, it's increasingly people are saying this is unacceptable. Right, and, and this there, is are where, yeah. there, there are technologies that um, you you know you don't need to just. This is a, an example of people think that machine learning is magic, um, but they don't realize it's a fault can be a false friend, as it were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. So time is flying, and we need to. We have other questions waiting. So Alessio wanted to ask, and then Pedro again. Yeah, first of all, thanks for the presentation. I have just, just to follow a more philosophical question related to the relationship between AI and, and human expert abuse them. So I'm also very interested in the interplay between self-learning AI and crime, but I'm also a bit, a bit skeptical about the idea of the existence already in the market of AI self-programming uh, and at the same time reliable uh, algorithmic trading system, for example. Mm -hmm. How, how, re, how really is the self-programming nature of some algorithm trading system? Because I, I still see them uh, an hybrid human AI system at the moment. And the idea to push for, to taking away responsibility from, from human is, is in the agenda of, for example, big players. My feeling is you should just look at them as tools, like in a, an advanced form of statistics. And if you, if you think of a trading system, um, algorithms are very good at analyzing huge amounts of data. They can recommend portfolios. They can do um, what we call smart order routing to uh, place trades. The important thing is to have a human who says, you know, actually, I don't think I want to do this because, you know, I can see the bigger picture. So humans are very good at seeing what I'm calling the bigger picture. All right. And, 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 the, and they should be encouraged to question the information that they'll be given by the, by the algorithm. So uh, this is, goes back to what I was saying about pilots. Ultimately, pilots should be able to, you know, have some sort of, you know, be able to take control of the plane if there's, uh, you know, if, if clearly uh, catastrophes <laughs> about to happen. Okay, and Pedro? Um, it's somehow related to Professor Ringa's point now and, and Philip's Philip, uh, question before. I, I, I read one of your papers yesterday, the auditing algo, and there was something on it that I thought was quite interesting that I haven't thought before, that instead of thinking about algorithms as white against black boxes, you should look at them at these many shades of gray. And then yes. also your point now that you think that a lot of positions are being taken to um, uh, kind of like, we have better tools than just using complete black boxes. So I was thinking on like, uh, would you take a stand there that there might be some kind of role in guiding through the shades of grays and developing out. Yeah, no, no, I, I, absolutely. And, and this goes back to uh, the question about, you know, what if you want to be a successful law uh, department, you, you need to te teach technology, um, you know, in, 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 and, uh, the, the, in, and encourage, you know, the students to experiment, uh, okay? And not to just take it for face value that, uh, you know, if, you, if you're teaching statistics, you know, and the student, just said, well, this is the result that I've got from the model, and they couldn't justify why it was correct or not correct. You, you know, you'd, you'd really give them very poor marks, wouldn't you? And I think the, 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 the increasingly this, prob the, this model probably would be the same, you know, in a law department. Uh, the, uh, I think the, although um, people don't like change, I repeat that I think this is an opportunity uh, and, and not just for somebody like me to disrupt somebody else's area, but 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 also for um, you know uh, you know particularly new law students, uh, you know that you can do these days. You know the, the, there's lots of opportunities. You can you know d develop new new things. Uh, you can start a company. Uh, you can develop a new research area. Uh, so there are lots of positives around. Uh, but, you know, that you need to actually know a few basic things so you can actually contribute. 
That's a wonderful uh, moment to close, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry we're not able to take all the questions that were in the chat, but I guess you can continue them on a bilateral basis. Um, we, because we are over time, I, I think we, we should thank Philip for a wonderful talk, for really giving us an extremely rich overview of different issues. We've learned a lot and um, they were able to discuss a lot in different directions, but it's been really, really wonderful. So thanks so much for your time and for joining us here today. Thank you. No, thank you, for the, thank you for the invitation. It's very interesting to hear people's comments on that because we all learn from these things. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. And technology has not been just the subject, but also the method of talking to each other. So uh, <laughs> thanks for that. And we hope to see you in person in flesh and blood at some point in the future. Yeah. Okay, goodbye. Thank you. Thanks everybody for joining. <laughs> and see you all soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Goodbye.